two participants, that'll probably get a little higher. That's, that's wonderful. So without further ado, I'm going to um, have uh, Bill Norris um, introduce the group and um, maybe share your screen and uh, we'll get going. Okay, how's everybody doing tonight? This is a project that's been going on for eight years. My name's Bill Norris, I'm the botanist at Western New Mexico University here in town. And I've been privileged to work with four excellent botanists over that time on this project. Dr. Kelly Kinter, I've known for almost 30 years. He's a professor at the University of Kansas. He's the author of a couple books on the ethno uh, botany of Plants of the Tall Grass Prairie. He's authored a book on Echinacea. He's a wonderful plant ecologist. Uh, he's really added a lot to this project. Uh, Dr. Russell Kleiman came here via maybe a non-intuitive path via Case Western Medical School. I get that right, Russ? Yes, sir. Yeah, before that Stanford, and he had a long career as a general surgeon here in Silver City. And about 15, 16 years ago, he decided to take a different path. And uh, he is now, he um, is a full-time botanist in his quote unquote retirement. They don't think he would call that retirement. He's put together this wonderful website, uh, HilaFlora.com, uh, which we were already talking about. And he's really, really uh, done a lot of good things in our understanding of the flora of New Mexico. He's co-author of a soon to be published, I think, book, Mosses of New Mexico. Dr. Richard Felger, uh, who's affiliated with the University of Arizona. He, he's not one of our presenters tonight, but he's every bit as involved in this project as the other four of us. Uh, written a lot of books on the flora of, of uh, the state of Sonora, ethnobotany. He's just a wonderful botanist, and uh, we've enjoyed having him participate in this project. He's got a book in the works, Trees of the Gila, that he's co-authoring with Kelly, which I hope to see in print soon. And now we've got uh, Ms. Patrice Muchnick, who I've known for about 20 years. She was a wonderful biology lab director at Western New Mexico University for well over a decade. Um, she got her master's degree at uh, Ohio University in plant and environmental ecology. Did I get that right, Patrice? Yeah, that's close. Yeah, and I can tell you that she is a real champion for wilderness and for plants of the Gila. She now uh, basically oversees Heart of the Gila, a nonprofit, which does a lot of good things. So um, as we move forward, and Kelly's going to take the lead in the first part of this presentation, I was thinking, I've, I've known all four of these individuals for a long time. They're all good friends. I've been out with each one of them individually in various subsets. Just doing the math, I think between the five of us, there's between 120 and 140 hours of experience doing botanical field work, which is a uh, <laughs> really kind of humbling to think about that. But as you see the results of this project, um, as we present it kind of in tag team fashion, I think part of the, the reason for that is we, we bring different backgrounds, different expertise. All five of us are really passionate about plants and uh, this has been a great project. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly and I'm, gonna, I'm in charge of advancing the slides and Kelly's gonna um, just tell me when it's time to advance or go backwards and uh, take it away, Kelly. Well, greetings, friends and fellow botanists. It's uh, great to speak to you tonight. And of course, uh, probably everyone here knows where the Gila Cliff Dwellings are located. So that's uh, smack dab in the northern part of this map. And to get there, of course, you head north through the wonderful Gila National Forest and past Gila Hot Springs to get to the Cliff Dwellings. Next, Bill. So, Bill, you might want to say something about this, because go ahead. Um, so this, one of the major products of this project is to basically, what are the plants that occur in the Gila Cliff dwellings? It's less than a mile square and one large parcel and one small parcel. Um, before you start thinking about what conservation measures you might undertake, you need to know what's there. So um, we generated a plant list which incorporates not only plants that we've found, but we also are, are, we've become aware of a lot of collection that was done, I think in the 1970s, there are plant specimens deposited in herbaria, especially University of Arizona in Tucson and the University of uh, Texas, El Paso. So this is 
the a major probably the major product of this pro not the only one product of this project and then by the end of this presentation i'm going to ask you all to think about somebody something that somebody asked me 20 years ago a little uh what good is a plant list it seems like old time botany well i hope we convince you at the end of this presentation that there's a lot of value in doing good old-fashioned basic field botany and compiling plant lists like this there's a lot of information that you can um, actually determine about a flora next yes so essentially a close up here showing in, in the red boxes the part of the lands that are actually the cliff dwellings. Most of us are familiar with the trail which goes into the cliff dwellings themselves that the cursor's at. And of course there's a disconnect unit, the TJ Ruin site, which actually is the better archaeological site with a wonderful two-story uh, large ser series of room blocks um, that's never been excavated, um, which is where the main village main number of people lived uh, when this was occupied. Next. And of course there's been work done on this archaeology and of course the Membrays was a fabulous culture known for these great pots. The cliff dwellings, there's debate on what its use was, maybe a ceremonial, maybe it's a few families. Um, we do know it had uh, occupation period it's not a very big space. Again, the TJ run was a much larger village site. It's been adequately dated. Um, dendrochronology bored holes into the beams and they could tell what dates they are with the wonderful lab over in Arizona. Next. And I'm, good, and I'm gonna infer from your pauses at the end of your description of each slide, Kelly, that I'm gonna move on. The That's other right. Thing, yep, you don't have to say that, go ahead. And of course, uh, we had uh, the Membres, the Apache occupied the area up until settlement time. Of course, they were removed by the uh, federal government and a bunch of wars and fighting and all of that. Um, people discovered the cliff dwellings and there was some early exploration. There was also looting and not such good <laughs> things and digging up of bodies and goods and pots and Lots of stories about mummies, which were rat bodies and kids and things like that. And so there was a push to protect it. And to Theodore Roosevelt established a national monument in November 16, 1907, which is really great so that it got protected uh, as you now see it. If I may jump in with a little aside, I didn't know this until about a year ago. A lot of you know who Peter Russell is, rather non-assuming individual. Uh, he's done a lot of good uh, here in southwestern New Mexico. I stumbled upon a reference of a book that he wrote 30 years ago, uh, Gila Cliff Dwellings National Monument of Environmental History. You can read the rest of this. This is a wonderful resource to, looking at the cultural history of the Gila Cliff Dwellings. And um, I was so glad I found this and I bought it on uh, Amazon. And I just, every time I read it, I learn something new about the cliff dwellings. <laughs> Of course, go back further and what affects the plant species distribution is, of course, the geology. But the major factor at the cliff dwellings is the volcanic activity that occurred in the Miocene. And that literally laid the foundation for what is the physical cliff dwellings uh, located in Gila conglomerate. What really makes the site work, of course, is that the Gila River, the West Fork, cut through there made a riparian area, but also made the big cliffs and the erosion of the Cliff Dweller Canyon uh, actually created those caves. So you had the cutting down of the Gila conglomerate, which created the wonderful canyons and areas there to explore. Here's a topo map, seeing the area more as you would know it, um, with the West Fork of the Gila in the top part and our challenge was, of course, not just to explore the cliff dwellings themselves in that canyon, but actually to look at the entire uh, park unit. And of course, the difficulty of that is it's not a level piece of land. <laughs> canyons and lots of different substrates and things to climb to look for plants. A little more detail on the geology and of course the Gila conglomerate um, is a substrate itself with plants can grow up on, but not easily. It's literally a cement. Look at that close up picture. That's just like what we think of a cement with little pieces of rock fragments 
in this material, which of course was molten hot at one point and flowing across the landscape and picking up gravels and rocks. And that's why it's pretty tough material that can stand in the cliffs and columns that exist out there. And here we have, uh, oops, went ahead. So actually before we started this project, which is a, a plant inventory of the cliff dwellings of the vascular plants, one of our team members, Russ, conducted an inventory of the bryophytes of the, of the era of the monument. And he actually had a published paper which came out about the same, about the time that we started this project. And so Russ is gonna tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Bill. I'm not really trying to uh, toot my own horn with this slide, toot but I'm really, just trying to <laughs> I'm really just trying to say what you just said, that uh, around 2010, uh, Karen Blissard, who's my wife, who's the, uh, the expert in the family on liverworts, and I applied for a collection of research permit to the National Park Service for bryophytes. <clears throat> and we were awarded that, uh, that permit. So in 2011 and 2012, uh, we conducted a bryophyte inventory. It's quite a special place to heal cliff dwellings. Um, <clears throat> the West Fork itself, which is the main body of water that flows through there, is on one side really of the cliff dwellings. And <clears throat> it isn't the best bryophyte habitat. But those vertically cut, even undercut cliff walls in a perennially wet canyon, that's a spectacular habitat for bryophytes, bryophytes being mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. So it turns out to be a very special place in terms of bryophytes. And over the course of those two years, we found uh, about half as many bryophytes in this one square mile as you have in the entire uh, three and a half million acres of the Gila National Forest. <clears throat> so at the time that we finished this um, inventory in 2013, before the new inventory started, we had 51 species of mosses in four families and four liverwort species in three families. We didn't have any hornworts and uh, even up to this day there have never been, there's never been a hornwort found in New Mexico. So we had a total of 55 species of bryophytes in the Gila as of 2013 when the, when the uh, first bryophyte inventory concluded. Go ahead, next, Bill. And here's where it stands now. After uh, several more years of collecting, <clears throat> we have added 12 new moss species and four families <clears throat> since 2013. We added most of these in 2013. I believe it was 2013 that was a very wet year. <clears throat> I realize that's kind of hard to contemplate right now. We haven't had a wet year in so long, it seems like. But we had a wet year, I believe it was 2013. We added almost all of these new moss species in that one year. There were new channels and backwaters opened up along the Gila River. Up in the, in the first inventory, the one we published in Edwin Z in 2013, we had no true aquatic mosses. And one of these 12 new moss species that we added in the last few years is a true aquatic that showed up in one of those backwaters. So we added 12 to the 55, and we now have 67 bryophytes known from the Gila uh, Cliff Lanes National Monument, 63 mosses. We haven't added any liverworts, but we might add another one yet. The picture there is Weissia ligulifolia. It's quite a common moss, uh, but we added it in this uh, last few years. <laughs> Next, Bill. One thing I like to show people is the diversity, the diverse appearance of a lot of mosses, because in every room of about 30 people, <clears throat> uh, not maybe as sophisticated as the group we have here today, but in a re representative room of 30 people, there's usually at least one person who thinks that moss is one genus and species, that moss is one organism. That's far from the case. There are probably about 18,000 species of mosses worldwide, and around 300 of them, three to 400 in the state of New Mexico, lots. <clears throat> and you can see from, from this slide how different they look. Now, until you get down to about the species level, it's pretty easy to tell these things apart. In the upper left there, 
you have Campylodelphus chrysophilus, that species name I believe means yellow leaf. <clears throat> this, uh, that particular moss has been described as what it looks like if, if you were to take a cat and electrify its tail. That's what people describe <laughs> that as. <laughs> My apologies to people who have cats in their home. <clears throat> uh, the one in the middle, Leptodictium riparium, you can't even tell because the water is so clear, but that's taken through several inches of water. That's the true aquatic moss that we have of the cliff dwellings. To the right of that on top is Physodens. This is another quite interesting growth habit. That moss grows in two dimensions, basically. The leaves come out flat on either side of the stem. Below there, we have Leptobrium pyroformi with these very long stalks to the uh, capsule where the spores are produced. And on the lower left, we have Grimia pulvinata, again, a very distinctive looking moss. This is a very arid adapted moss. It has those very long white awns or hair points on the ends of the leaves. But again, the main reason to show you this slide is to demonstrate how you can tell these mosses apart, even with a hand lens. <clears throat> Next, Bill. A couple more mosses. This time I thought I'd show you a little bit what they look like under the microscope. Turns out that a lot of uh, people are turned off to mosses and bryophytes because a lot of the work is microscopic work, but it becomes quite a lot of fun. On the left, two, uh, left one third of your slide, you have Timia megapolitana. That's what it looks like where the arrow is. The cursor is on what it looks like if, if you see it in the soil. After you collect that, you have to look under the microscope to make sure you, you know what you've got. And you can see in the lower part right below the arrow, you can see a microscopic view of the leaf down here. Am I, I don't know if my cursor is showing up too or not. It is uh, right here. Uh, on the other side, over here. Um, there you go. That's what the apex, the, whoops. I'll get us back. That's what the apex of the leaf looks like. You can see it looks a little bit like a rip saw. Look at those. Look at those uh, teeth there. You don't even see them in the, in the habit shot on top. But once you put that under the microscope, you see these wonderful looking teeth. If you were a little microscopic herbivore, you might be deterred from eating that leaf if you saw those teeth staring back at you. And on the left there on the bottom, you can see a cross section of about the level, the mid-level of that picture on the right. So that's a cross section of the leaf. We do those freehand, believe it or not, you can get pretty good at doing a, a freehand cross section of even a moss leaf. And what's interesting there, over here, is a couple of things. You can see these guide cells, what we call guide cells, clear cells going right through the mid the midrib or the costa of the leaf. And in this particular genus, you have very bulgy cells on top of the lamina itself. That's what Timia megapolitana looks like under the microscope. The right two thirds of the slide is uh, Rogula brium levophyllum. It looks completely different, doesn't it? On top is what it looks like when it's moist. <clears throat> On bottom is a very happy Rogula brium levophyllum. Which it, one is this, Russ? This? Rogula brium levophyllum. Okay, got it. One of the problems with mosses relative to vascular plants is that mosses don't have very many common names. So if you're, if you're not into Latin, you kind of have to compromise a little bit. That lower right-hand slide, the very lower right, shows a highly reproductive stem. All those reddish brown filaments coming out between the leaves are non-sexual reproductive structures called gemmy. And once you see something packed like that in our area, with this shape of leaf, it almost always has to be Rogula brium levophyllum around here. And if you were to very carefully remove that stem and look underground, you'll see that it also has what are called rhizoidal tubers. That's what's in the middle uh, of the slide on the bottom. Looks like little goblet this, uh, goblets. So this thing here, yeah. Those are, again, structures that are reproductive, asexual. So if this whole thing gets disrupted, those break off extraordinarily easily from that uh, holdfast, that uh, rhizoid. It's not really a root, but it looks like a root. Those things break off right where the cursor is extraordinarily easily if this thing gets disturbed. Each one of those will grow a whole new 
moss plant. And as, as will those gemmy, those filiform reddish brown structures in the lower right, any one of those will grow an entire new moss. They're fascinating little plants. Is that my last slide, Bill? Yes, sir. Hey, on to you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to, Don, do we have any chat messages that you'd like to bring up? Not yet. Okay. So I'd like to give you a, a feel for what the cliff dwellings is like if you go there. And we had permission to go off trail and we we're, we feel very fortunate about that. If you go there, they really want you to stay on this main trail. This is the main unit of the Gila Cliff Dwelling. This is the Cliff Dweller Canyon Trail. There's plenty to see right on this trail. They really encourage you to stay on the trail. And even we're all challenged by this pandemic. It's still open. We've, I've been up there with Russ, with Patrice, with Kelly at various times this year. Um, they let us in. There's plenty of visitors there uh, masked up. So if you decide you wanna go up and check out these plants here, this beautiful time of year, mid-fall, um, you can do so. And you're gonna be uh, walking the Cliff Dweller Canyon Trail. You'll start off at this visitor center here or check station. And uh, they kind of want to keep track of how many people are on the trail. And once they give you the green light and they give you a little background information, you walk across this trail or this bridge across the West Fork. And you will almost immediately be, when you step on the other side, you will be, you will see the West Fork itself. And uh, here's some folks having a lot of fun down here in the water. You'll see several willow species and narrow leaf cottonwood. Uh, the interesting thing about this whole monument, and, and I think, explaining how many plants we found. It's great topographic diversity. And uh, so we're starting here along the West Fork, right down along the water. As my colleagues on this project know, this is my favorite place to go and wander and look for plants, get my feet wet. And it seems like we all have different places that we gravitate towards. But as soon as you cross that bridge, this is a nice loop trail. It's about 1.1 mile. Keep on hiking. And, and if you take the left fork, and you walk along the creek itself, you will uh, see lots and lots of coniferous forest species. You'll see a lot of herbs, Arizona valerian right here. If you, uh, if you look up on the cliff wall, you'll see a lycophyte, a spike moss. If you look down in the water, uh, particularly early in the year, you'll see golden smoke. Through the summer, you'll see columbine, beautiful plant. You'll see monkey flower. And so you'll walk along this extent this part of the trail and then you're going to hit this hairpin and then you'll hike up and that's a pretty this uh really doesn't give justice to that's a pretty steep hike up the trail i'm losing, looking for my cursor here he'll show up in a second so when you hit that hairpin you walk up and uh you'll look to the left and you'll and you'll look up and you'll see the dwellings themselves this is what a lot of most people ultimately what they want to see so you hike up and then uh, you can see that we have gone off trail and we've, I remember being off with Kelly five, six years ago. It's the only place we found silver leaf oak in the, in the monument. And so this has been uh, real profitable for us to go off trail, which we have had permission to do. And once you get to the top, then uh, you get a reward. You get a flat stretch of this trail that you can hike still with plenty of plants, far different vegetation plants here than along the creek. I always like to show this picture of fringe pecoon um, which I know from, I, I hail from the Midwest originally. I was astounded the first time I went to the cliff dwellings years ago. I'm used to seeing this in tall grass prairie. What's it doing here along the edge of this trail? But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm glad to see it every year. As you walk towards the dwellings, you'll see cacti, you'll see ferns, you'll see plants more adapted to drier, more exposed uh, situations. So here we are. We started here, we crossed the bridge, we walked along the creek. And then we hike straight up this hairpin and now we're walking back. We're approaching the dwellings and invariably there's somebody, a very knowledgeable volunteer or staff person there to tell you just about anything you wanna know about the dwellings. Certainly take advantage of that if you're there. There's interesting plants right around the dwellings. I'm gonna show you a picture later on of red stem monkey flower, which Richards with his sharp eyes spotted about six, seven years ago. So in addition to these archeological remnants here, um, there's lots of plants right here in the vicinity of the dwellings. So we continue on and there's a variety of cacti and ferns and uh, there's uh, some ferns and cacti here, of course. And then uh, you're gonna start hiking down and uh, here we go. This, this slope as you start hiking down the trail here, this, this was burned 
six, seven years ago. So uh, since we started this project, so the vegetation changed dramatically. Does any of my colleagues want to have anything to say about this image and your experiences on this slope, how this has changed? Hey, Bill, um, at the end of the <clears throat> at the end of the the slideshow, then I have some pictures of that. What it looks like currently, and it's uh, pretty pretty dense and vegetated now. And also, this slope has been um, planted several times. Uh, mm -hmm. Has been um, tended by a couple of other groups that have actually uh, seeded in here over the last couple of years. Bill, yeah. I can add something in here too, if you don't mind. So right after the burn, right after the burn, this hillside was covered with mullen. <laughs> yeah. So, oh no. Yeah, you remember that? So yes. and not just this hillside, many of the north facing slopes on this property were just absolutely overrun by mullen and then they disappeared. And what popped up next was mostly Robinia uh, locust. New Mexico locust. Oh yeah. Yep. So uh, this vegetation on this slope has changed remarkably. And I'm looking forward to hearing Patrice's perspectives and what's taken, you know, the reconstruction that's going on there in the last couple of years. And finally, you come back to the bridge, you cross the bridge and the people, the volunteers and staff at the, at the check station here are genuinely interested. They've been wonderful. Um, there have been a number of supervisors since we started this project to the last person. They've supported our project. All the volunteers, interns, staff who meet us invariably. There's always somebody there when we, when we get on this trail. They're always, what did you find? Did you, have, did you find any new plants? So this is a, I've hiked this probably 20 or 30 times, this loop trail. I never get tired of it. And I see, I don't know if I'm controlling this or Don is. Oh, here we go. We have a question. Why has the mullen disappeared on that burn slope? And I'm gonna back up this second. Why has the mullen disappeared on this slope? And I, I have a few theories. I wonder if some of my three colleagues want, mullen's a biennial, it, it lives for two years. It puts out that rosetta plants when, when, it, when it's provided a stirred habitat to get established. The second year sends up that flowering stalk and then it dies. Uh, and then for the next generation. So I'm thinking that maybe it, it, I'm going to wait for Patrice and Kelly and Russ to chime in here. Perhaps as vegetation, as this slope became a bit more, more vegetated, perhaps the mowing just uh, got maybe shaded out. What do you think here, folks? I think it's, it might be worth waiting until we see the photos at the end. Um, and I, because the mullen is that was actually not completely gone. And um, I think the photos will demonstrate a lot of uh, what the succession has been and um, how, <clears throat> how much mullen there is there now. But I, I actually beg to differ that there's still, I, there must be less, but um, I can tell you I've pulled uh, thousands of mullen out of that hillside this year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and not to let the cat out of the bag, uh, mullen, one of the spectacular things we discovered about this flora is that less more than less than 10 percent of the flora less than 50 plant species are non-native species and one of those non-native plant species is mullen that is we'll, we'll say more about that a little bit later and i think we got one more chat coming in here message let's let's see carol and richard work with sky island alliance to remove hundreds of mullen a years ago well thank you so there's a there is a major part of the answer to that question. Okay, I'm sure that was really hard work. Okay, just trying to advance this. There we go. So I, I urge you, even if it's in the winter when there's not, obviously um, the plant life will be less evident. This is a space, if you've not done this, you need to get on this Cliff Dweller Canyon Trail and hike it, which uh, by itself, really provides access to a whole bunch of plant species. Um, and there's of course a lot of other territory in here that we have all managed to uh, had the opportunity to explore. I'm gonna just summarize this slide. I'm gonna turn it back over to Kelly. I mean, ultimately, and, and, and Patrice and Russ and Kelly jump in here. We, the goals of this project are first and foremost, what's there to, to generate a plant list? And we certainly have done that. 
to get a handle on what the diversity of this monument is. And let me remind you that Gila Cliff Darlings National Monument, both units together comprise less than one square mile. It's pretty small. It's pretty uh, typical in projects like these, floristic projects, to uh, determine what percent of the flora is native. Kind of get a handle on what's the health of the flora, the integrity of the flora. And we're gonna, what species are common? Which species are rare? Are there any species which have any state or federal status in terms of uh, threatened, endangered? What are the habitat preferences uh, of the plants in the Gila Cliff Dwellings? And is this going to come out as we talk about the results? Uh, you know, we got everything from black grandma, which is a desert grassland species, down to, you know, some aquatic buttercups. It's just the, the, the topographic diversity in this monument really is spectacular, and that provides all kinds of opportunities for different plants to occur within that less than one square mile. Yeah, and which species have, have official status, state or federal level. And then since we have, we have access to quite a bit of historical data, which species found essentially back in the 1970s by botanists working out of University of Arizona, University of Texas, El Paso, are there any species which we haven't been able to find? Well, the short answer is yes. Are there, and how many of those have we found? Are there species that we found that former botanists didn't find? The answer to that question is yes as well. So these are the types of questions that are of interest and that you can address through projects like this. And so now I'm gonna turn this over to Kelly, who's gonna talk about yeah. the methodology of this project. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, I would add too that when we started looking at the list, many of us knew that there were species on the list that were incorrect. So we also view that another important part here is for us to correct past mistakes in addition to having really several good sets of eyes here to look at a variety of habitats. So as this picture shows, there's these wonderful variety of habitats that Bill was mentioning. And so we knew that we needed to explore all of them more. And of course, I personally took uh, great interest in hiking more of the backcountry and yep. looking for habitats that might uh, hold other species. So you see a variety of those habitats here. Next. So um, I used uh, the app G Gaia GPS, and these are some of the routes that I took. And I did hike others, including I've been on top of the Gila cliff dwellings. Just curious what might be on top. There's no archeological sites that I can see up on top. But I would go out and when I found plants, I would use Gaia to uh, create the location point. Because for the herbarium specimens that we make, we want to have uh, a geographic location that's specific. We also want to have habitat information, of course, the species name, collector date, all that information. So this allowed me to uh, make sure we got a good coverage of the park by taking new routes and also to make sure that we looked at a variety of different habitats. So I feel pretty confident that we've really have covered most all of the park. Next. Um, so we also have plants of different habitats, ecological, you know, strata. I mean, for instance, this mistletoe, we don't always think about looking up in trees to find other plants, but indeed we do have some parasites that like to live in trees. So uh, the way I work strategy-wise is when we first started, it was just kind of a free-for-all, but after you have <laughs> and you started collecting things that someone else collected, and then you go out again maybe six months or a year later, and you might even collect the same thing. So strategically, um, I first realized I needed to always carry the list. So when you saw something that you weren't sure was collected, you'd look at the list or if it's something that you can't quite identify on site, you would collect it and later look at the list. And then more recently, I've been working on a strategy of what should be there that we've not collected. So we circled a couple of lists around and I've been doing work at Lake Roberts. And so I did a comparison of Lake Roberts to the cliff dwellings and thinking about what should be at both. And if, it was, if I had something at the Lake Roberts that wasn't the cliff dwellings, and I started looking for that. It really gets confusing when you've collected three or 400 species to find the ones that you haven't seen yet. Yeah, we have, we've collected about a thousand plant specimens. And let me reassure you, we're not out there to decimate plant populations. There's numerous instances where if there's only one plant, we take a photograph and it's totally appropriate protocol in terms of uh, 
preparing plant specimens for her deposit in the her herbarium, the Daly Zimmerman Herbarium, to mount that photograph with just a standard plant label. We've done that with a number of things. We're not decimating plant populations whatsoever. And uh, just off trail here again, we, we've got permission to do that. And I think Kelly probably took this picture. This is yeah. up, up here. Just, we just had some glorious times exploring this less than one square mile as I turn it back to Kelly. Different seasons? Yes, different seasons. Um, although there's not a lot to see in the snow. They are surprising. There is an early spring flora bloom, particularly in the canyon protected areas itself. Um, so it's worth looking then. It seems that the rich ripe time for our plant collections though is after the monsoons. That's when you tend to see oh, yeah. things. And with good years that continues into the fall. This past summer, and as Russ mentioned, several last years have been dry and that's made it harder to find things. Really the best years to do botany work in a lot of these sites is in a really wet year, a really wet monsoon year. But you find things, you know, every time you go out. So um, we keep looking. Also the river itself and the adjacent riparian area has been particularly rich. It seems obvious that some things literally drift down, so you get new seeds that might pop up in the riparian area, or things that come down because the seeds have been dispersed from up above a long ways. So the riparian areas, because they offer a variety of wet and dry sites, some of the sites next to the river and in the adjacent grasslands are very sandy and get very dry and droughty. So there's not just aquatic and riparian plants, but a lot of that like dry habitats too. <laughs> Challenges. Yeah. Go yes. ahead, Kelly. <laughs> well, there's some areas that are pretty steep and uh, it's also very tiring um, to <laughs> hike some of these areas. Um, even though there's good habitats in some of these sites, um, we obviously didn't explore uh, every meter or every site. Um, clearly though, look at this slide, you do want to look at the protected north facing slope. So maybe something not quite so steep, but something similar because there's a lot of diversity in the more protected moist slopes. Yeah, I, th this photo was taken by a good friend of ours, Scott Zager. And I think, I just love this photograph. It really catched within once in less than one square mile, we have this topographic diversity in here. I don't think uh, team, Team members, we're going to probably be exploring this cliff right here, this cliff face right here. I think this picture, I think Scott took this picture in the vicinity of the dwellings proper that most people go see, looking across Cliff Dweller Canyon. Yeah. Bill, Bill, I've been on top of that cliff. Uh, in fact, I think Kelly might have been on that cliff with me. Yeah. Although um, I was on there myself, and that's the only place I've gotten in trouble with the cliff dwelling staff. They do not want you to be seen by the public standing up yes. there. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so so after we kind of heard about that and it made sense. So we made a point to not be seen. So there was a lot of, we needed to you know, work on the cliff habitats. It was better not to do it right there at the Cliff Dwellings Canyon, but maybe further up or on the other side. So we tried not to be seen going off trail, even in Cliff Dwellers Canyon, you know, it's like if there's a plant, you know, a few meters off the trail, you kind of wait till people pass by and then you might might uh, collect the above ground portion, but also, especially in the Cliff Dwellers Canyon, you were thinking mm -hmm. about, do I want to remove this? Will it affect someone's, you know, view of seeing something? So if something's really showy, you didn't want to harvest it in a, in a place that it might really be appreciated. Right. Challenges. What was the challenge here? <laughs> <laughs> I love that lower picture on the right. It Stay really alive. <laughs> Really, yeah. a new bridge since that picture too. So, but that creates right. disturbance, it brings in plants. So, you know, disturbance is a good thing for um, species to come up in new substrates. So all, all of us, uh, everybody's has, you know, limited time and there have been times we, that we've had time available to go work in the, in, up in the monument, but we have been able to do so because of access, this bridge over the West Fork here. So that's that's the challenge. Sometimes it just hasn't been possible to get up there for safety reasons. Likewise, uh, 
um, Ruff reminded me that it was the Miller fire that came through uh, within since the beginning of this project. You know, the monument was totally off limits I, for obvious reasons for extended period during one of the years of this project. Um, number of natural uh, disturbances um, which have uh, caused us to alter our strategies for doing our field work. Anybody have anything they want to add to these slides, comments? I, I would like to say, Bill, that when, when we've hiked through this exact area before things grew back, every time you heard a stick crack, you looked up to make sure a tree wasn't going to fall on you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, Bill, I'll just jump in here. Um, Ron Perry has a question about uh, are there any vernal pools in the area? I wouldn't call anything a vernal pool, but um, in the Gila conglomerate and some of the flats, like on top of the cliff dwellings, especially in the monsoons, you get these little depressions that do have their own flora, pr primarily of annuals. You'll get some inter couple of interesting annual euphorbias. You'll get a little dwarf uh, tradescantia, um, spiderwort. Um, I found a couple grasses in those that are somewhat unique. Um, so those can be considered vernal pools, although no one seems to call them that here in New Mexico. And they probably need to be looked a bit closer at for bryophytes, because there are a whole host of bryophytes that just love that kind of situation. Um, and so I need to head back up there, uh, maybe yeah. after it's been a little wetter. Uh, yeah. This type of kind of year, they be, they're really hard to see in those little flat depressions. When it's wetter, they're easier to see. Yeah. Yep. So what are the results of this project, Kelly? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of species, a lot of species. 500, so between the, the, uh, the historic taxa, and Kelly alluded to this earlier, we've actually, uh, Richard arranged for a loan of most of the specimens deposited at the University of Arizona Herbarium, and we, we looked at those critically, and, uh, and we're, we need to do the same thing with the specimens from the UTEP Herbarium. But uh, you take what we found, add on historic, tag, historic species that we haven't found, a grand total of 593 vascular plant taxa within less than one square mile, including this is one of the 593 uh, little buttercup. Uh, that, uh, this is this boggles my mind that uh, there are almost 600 plant species that we've between the historic botanists working 20, 30 years ago and what we found occur within less than a square mile. First, you know, if you're going to say plant species, it's 670, Bill. Right. No offense, Russ. Yes. It's vascular. Thank you. But you're, but you're right. Yep. And our project, and this dates back to 2013, we had generous funding from the Western National Park Association, some other funding sources. We have, between the five of us, have documented 512 species, including about 25 or 30 just this year, even despite the dry conditions. Because we we hit it pretty hard this year, particularly, I think, late summer. And this is that plant I, I mentioned earlier. Richard found this with his sharp eyes six, seven years ago as we we're walking by the cliff. This is a small little monkey flower. Uh, you know, it's not like those big yellow flower things you see in the stream. And I was just amazed how Richard was able to just pick this right out, um, growing in a little bit of soil um, adjacent to the dwellings. So 512 vascular plant taxa. And I, go ahead. Someone's going to jump in there. Oh no, oh. that was me. I apologize. That was me. Go ahead. Yeah. And you know, no, <laughs> yeah. so projects like this, you know, we're wrapping this up. We plan to start writing this up sometime next year for publication and checklist for the for interested uh, botanists who just are passing through the monument. We we are. I think we're not finding ten and twenty new species when we go in there. It's more like uh, one or two or three new species. It's starting to wind down. Um, we are kind of winding down this project, but like I said, we've added about 25 new species this year. Documentation. So we collect a specimen, either, you know, usually a real plant specimen or a photograph of every plant that we have encountered. These specimens 
by, by contractual agreement belong to the National Park Service. They're, they belong to the United States, to the citizenry of this country. We have an agreement that they will be permanently housed in the Daly Zimmerman Herbarium here at Western. And that's a good agreement because we have the facilities to store to properly store these plants. And we've had uh, somebody's climbing this tree after this mistletoe. Uh, we've had some wonderful help from some of our GNPS members, Angela Flanders and Jane Spinty and Betsy Cato and Karen Nakakahara. Um, think about the, the task of trying to mount and process about a thousand plant specimens. It's a daunting process and they've and cheerfully done it. As you can see the expression on Angela's, they, these ladies love working in her barn. We love having them in there. So we document these specimens. 30, 40 years down the road, somebody wants to repeat this study. If all, the, if all that's available is a plant list with no specimen documenting the plants on that list, you really can't go verify that those plants were actually there. So this is a real critical part of this study. Anybody have anything else to add to that? And as I said, uh, you know, we're, if it's only one or two plants, or it's really hard to make specimens of cacti, we take a photograph and uh, we, can, we can mount that on a herbarium specimen as well. We're very conscious. We're not out to decimate plant populations at all. Um, we, we definitely, if it's a small population, we don't collect anything. So of these, this is another, another really astounding result. Of these 512 plant species that we found during these last eight years, over 90% of them are native. Now I'm gonna give you a little perspective here. I'm from the Midwest, so is Kelly. I've done a lot of projects like this in Iowa, and uh, you're lucky to hit 80% of the flora being native. Usually it's like mid upper 70s. If flora yes. that's more than 90, go ahead, yes. Kelly. That's right. No, I was just going to agree. This is uh, rather remarkable that there's not more species that are exotic. It's rather, rather nice. Especially with all, I, I got online a couple of weeks ago. They, they get 20 or 30,000 people visiting cliff dwellings every year. It's a well-frequented monument, you know, and people coming from all over the country and outside the country. This is astounding. Richard has told me that, uh, and he's done a lot of work like this in California. There are regions in California where it's less than 50% native flora. So this is, uh, in, in, in talking to the folks at the Cliff Toys who are interested in this project, uh, these are the results that they find most interesting. Number one, that we found so darn many plant species within less than a square mile and number two, that over 90% of this flora is native. So those are the results, I think, when we complete this, that they're going to be informing visit, future visitors to the monument. Go ahead. Can you go back yep. one from that last one, Bill? There. So does Keep anybody, going? yeah, does okay. anybody recognize who that is, just out of curiosity? She's actually a, a well, she's a well-known author of plant books in New Mexico. That's Carolyn Dodson. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah. Okay, just wanted to, just wanted to wonder if anybody recognized her. Yeah, and I, I'm about ready to pass the baton on to Patrice, who is going to be talking about uh, a major aspect of this project, controlling these non-native species. One of those 48 non-native species is both this. I'm going to let her talk about it when we get to that slide. Um, we have found 236 plant species that weren't found by any of these previous botanists. Uh, that's astounding as well, but... Uh, you know, there were five of us working on this project for eight years. We all have different expertise. We spent a lot of time at this monument. Kelly has spent a lot of time here in the last three or four years. I think for me, it's been more of the first two or three years. But we all have different, uh, we all have different search images for different plants. My thing is sedges. Um, uh, you know, Russ, is, Russ has a search image, you know, for, for other types of plants better than I do. I think that has contributed to this find of so many plant species that previous botanists haven't found. It doesn't mean that there are any less botanists than us. Number one, we spent eight years doing this. Number two, there have been five of us doing this, which each of us have different expertise. Uh, number three, we, we all have a lot of experience doing projects like this. But still, 236 species that weren't documented prior to, to 2013. That's really kind of astounding. One of my favorite plants, Swamp Sedge. You see this right in the middle of the river. Anybody want to chime in on this slide or this this topic? 
And there are 83 species documented historically that we haven't found, like Netley packberry. And we haven't seen the specimen yet. I'm looking for, I think this is out at the University of Texas, El Paso. So there's some things we didn't find and we're looking for them. So uh, I think Kelly has some things yeah, to say. I'll talk uh, about this. Go for so it, Kelly. Some things that are reported from the cliff dwellings that we're doubtful about. We've removed some things from the list that are just erroneous, you know, that we knew were misidentifications. But the old lady slipper one really caught our eye. And, you know, it's believable if you think about it that there might be this yellow lady slipper that likes very moist habitats up Cliff Dwellers Canyon. And the first time I hiked up there beyond the trail, there's a spring site and it's moist and wet and it could almost seem like orchid habitat. Um, but the specimen that was collected before apparently is not labeled well or not very clear. And so we don't quite know where it was collected, but it ended up on the list. And we do know that Yellow's Lady Slipper is nearby in Little Creek. And I'm pretty convinced, and we're still going to keep talking about it, that it's most likely that the specimen, which is vague location, is actually about one that is from Little Creek. This plant is not very common. Um, Bill Rush, you may know, but we've got, what, only two or three locations in the Gila National Forest. It's yeah. very few locations. We have, a, we have a historical collection from Signal Peak that's never been um, relocated, unless, unless you've been there. I've never been able to find that. I've never <laughs> seen it. And the Little Creek, Creek location where this photograph that you have up was taken, I took that picture at the Little Creek location. Have you been there recently at all? That burned in the Miller fire. I was there two, two years ago. And was it still present there? Doing fine. The fire didn't touch that area. Cool. Okay. Very Incidentally, good. for of oh, all these, go ahead. Well, I was going to say there'll be a few things when we kind of pull this together. Ultimately, we're just we're going to decide that no, that doesn't go on the list. And in some ways, you hate to keep things on the list that are kind of exciting unless you really document it because people will just gravitate to going, oh my gosh, there must be that yellow lady slipper orchid up there in the canyon. And we don't want to propagate uh, past mistakes. Yep, that's a good way to put it. We incidentally have not found during the current study any orchid species, and we've been looking. Just a little, a little note I thought you'd want to be interested in. And there are also some species that, why, why haven't we found soap tree yucca in the Gila Cliff Dwellings National Monument? It's one of my favorite plants in this state. I've seen it right around here. Patrice, how, much, how often do you see, since you spent a lot of time up there, how often do you see soap tree yucca? up there near Hill Hot Springs and in that region? Uh, not super often, actually, no. Okay, do you, ever, do you ever see it? Yeah, yeah. And here's another one, Perry's agave. We don't have that in the mountain. You ever see that, Patrice, anywhere in your wanderings around that area? Yes. Yes, so, it's several rock ridges, and it's one I've been very interested in on the ethnobotanical side in the in the archaeological work, they found quids that people chewed on, and so that's usually <laughs> on agave, and the fibrous material is chomped on for a long time, and then kind of like old bubble gum is spit out. Um, so it's likely that agave was around there. Agave also could have been planted, so there also could have been plants around the cliff dwellings that the membranes people might have planted, and some might have survived, many didn't but I find it odd that yucca is not uh, there and that uh, agave is not there. What do you banana have, yucca? Do we have to mention 700 year old bubble gum in the paper? <laughs> <laughs> there is a uh, yucca fiber in the cliff dwellings that was found archeologically. Yeah. So, and I've been, I've been, in, I've been in the dwellings with Patrice a couple times in the last six weeks with Kelly back in July. I'm always looking up hoping I'm gonna find that soap tree yucca, the first one. I haven't succeeded. Lots of banana yucca. And, and as I'm gonna wrap up my portion, I'm gonna hand this off to Patrice. Um, we're gonna publish a paper, submit it to a peer-reviewed journal, the flora of the Gila Cliff Dwellings. 
um, for people to review. And we're also going to prepare some checklists working with the cliff dwelling staff that are more appropriate for the general public. Because what's the point of doing a study like this? We don't make we don't make the results of the study available both to scientists and to the general public who who are very fascinated about plants. So I'm I'm looking forward to moving on to this stage um, of the project. And I, Don, I think we have a chat, don't we? Message. Uh, it was just for you to pass the baton. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I get the hint. <laughs> Come on, the second. Patrice, we're going to talk. Go ahead, Patrice. Hello, everybody. Let's see if I can uh, generate some Zoom attention here. If I, uh, they say if you talk, then um, the camera heads towards you. So then I'll know if I'm in the, uh, if everybody can see me. Um, thanks for giving me a chance uh, to talk about non-native plants. Uh, and uh, the cliff dwellings. Uh, I know we're supposed to be done at around eight and I probably have around eight or nine minutes. So for all of you who are still hanging in there, I, I sure appreciate it. Um, as some of you may know, I live in the Gila cliff dwelling. I live in the Gila uh, Valley, just a, a couple of miles down from the cliff dwellings. So I consider this a, uh, my backyard and I'm honored to be able to go here and, and live here and, and visit here uh, really quite often. I got involved with non-native plants because uh, what are you going to do? They're everywhere. And uh, that's sort of where m much of the grant money and much of interest is uh, in terms of maintaining di uh, biodiversity. I feel if you're not interested, if you're not focused on the non-native plants, then it's hard to um, be able to uh, put your focus on maintaining uh, the biodiversity. So um, Cliff Dwelling's high priority target for uh, my projects um, because in and of itself, it is a high biodiversity area and because it is a gateway um, to, to the wilderness. Go ahead. I only see you guys. So um, people often ask um, how did non-natives enter the landscape? Um, generally through human history um, and through disturbances. Uh, these can be large scale disturbances or small scale disturbances. I'm, I'm going to, this picture is actually in that same area that you're talking about, that major uh, fire area. Uh, many of the trees have now come down. Uh, this young man is uh, sitting at, uh, resting after pulling many plants. But um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move anyway. So I, um, I'll talk to the next slide. So um, when you think about, uh, when you think about macro disturbance, actually, could you go back one? I'm, I apologize then. When you think about a macro disturbance uh, in this area with the 2011 fire, then you had a 2013 had major flooding. So um, for the up, uh, upland areas, uh, fire is the one that's causing most of the major disturbance. And in the lowland areas, it's the floods. In terms of human history, um, we have, uh, of course, a couple of hundred years worth of uh, farmers, sheep farmers, people bringing in uh, feed for their livestock, people bringing in plants to maintain uh, 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 for ornamental reasons, uh, like they did with tamarisk and they did with Siberian elm, um, and then for food crops that people bring in like alfalfa and um, domestic crops that uh, become feral, I like to talk about them. Go ahead and move to the next, thank you. In terms of micro disturbances in the cliff dwellings themselves, I've done um, collected uh, quite a bit of uh, data in the in the cliff dweller valley itself on what non natives are there, and then worked with the um, with the staff and the volunteers there as well as um, volunteers to to um, to identify how non natives are coming into the Cliff Dweller Canyon. I've done a, a small survey of the plants uh, in the Cliff Dweller Canyon. It's extremely diverse. I have uh, a list that I can share with others. Uh, in the springtime, this coniferous, uh, it, it has that uh, effect where you have this, both the desert effect and the riparian effect and the co uh, coniferous cover effect. So it's incredibly diverse. When you walk up the trail, oftentimes simple things like if they do trail work, they often will make small disturbances and non-natives will come in right along the trail. Or sometimes you'll have tree fall and you'll have non-natives come in. 
Um, in the bottom slide, that is the Cliff Dweller Canyon up a, um, before you, uh, like if you don't go up the trail, but you just walk up the, you just walk up the drainage. And what you'll notice there is that's actually filled with um, white clover, uh, the Melilitis alba. And that comes in just from just general runoff. And so part of the, uh, my work uh, with has been to uh, both identify plants in the, in the canyon, but also to help the staff get a sense of what should be there and um, what shouldn't be there. Next. Uh, part of the goal, um, I think, in any educational program with botany is to make people care about plants. Um, the cliff dwellings has been pretty much primarily focused on their cultural resources and less on their natural resources. So um, I think that the, the, the inventory has been really helpful for them to get the sense that they have something that's incredibly important. And um, so I've been working with the uh, staff, uh, volunteer staff uh, on the right, um, my right, uh, that's a giant bull thistle. That's a volunteer from the, uh, that's one of the staff from the cliff dwellings. On the left, that is in that field. Um, I'm happy to, uh, it's exciting to hear that the Sky Island took out a lot of that mullen. It was very, very thick with mullen again this year. Um, we went in and took out another set of a couple of thousand uh, mullen plants and uh, working with New Mexico wilderness rangers uh, to uh, remove those plants. Next. So um, here's that field, uh, Russ and colleagues. Um, if you notice that same right under, uh, not a field, but that hillside underneath the cliff, uh, still having quite a bit of mullein, but also now the locust coming in, the amorpha, uh, the oak. It's really exciting to see the area in restoration. It's, 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 it's really great. So who decides um, uh, what is, um, what kind of, plant is an invasive plant. So I have this thing about non-natives, natives, exotics, and basically I've come to start to think about plants as either native or non-native, and not to give them the terminology of an invasive species or um, because people tend to misuse the, the word. They'll use invasive, in my opinion, for native species if they grow fast and they don't like them. So for instance, the Forest Service now will consider juniper an invasive species because it'll come in in areas that uh, haven't been burned recently and takes over uh, grassland. And so to them, now they're considering juniper invasive. Once you put a plant on an invasive list statewide, then you can uh, have a plan to use chemicals to get rid of it. So I think it's important to think about natives and non-natives. Um, now, who decides who, which plants to, to, to remove? Uh, next, next slide. Next slide, Bill. Well, um, for me, you know, noticing like Bill was talking about and uh, my colleagues that there are between 35 species that, we found, that they found and 45 or 47 historically, so somewhere in there of non-natives, in all honesty, it was hard for me. I don't, I didn't know that. I'm uh, connected to the plants that I see the most. Um, and that's not necessarily uh, the ones that should be removed, but how do we decide which plants should be removed? Why am I deciding certain, to take certain plants out and not others? Um, one of them is um, ease <laughs> of getting them out. And also the sense that plants uh, may be displacing other plants, that non-natives may be displacing uh, native plants. So I think to some extent, my decisions have been subjective, um, but the state has a way to determine, and I don't think they have a very good determination because the way they decide is if it, if it gets in the way of forage. And so when you look at the state list of invasives and what we should worry about, they hardly ever include uh, many of the plants that we have in the riparian areas of the Gila. So um, everybody knows this horseweed. It's actually um, Canadian fleabane. And um, I, I pull this out because it's, it, it comes in very, very quickly with small disturbances. And in the Cliff Dweller Canyon, uh, those small, those hillsides are very complex. 
and uh, it's better to remove uh, any of the species that don't belong there so that that intricate web of uh, native species can be can can reestablish. On the right, that's a very common uh, prickly lettuce. You've probably seen that everywhere. I also find that this is important to, to take out. Um, uh, again, part of it is it's easy to take out and um, you find it along uh, trail sides. It tends to come in a lot with, uh, with travelers and shoe steps and, and hikers. In the middle is the white clover. Now this thing has in the idea, sometimes when you say, oh, there's not that many non-natives, when you look on the riparian areas in the West Fork, this thing is covering it. It just, it literally a landscape full. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> However, um, I don't, um, next slide. I don't, I haven't uh, worked with uh, taking out, oops, just one back if you can. I haven't worked at taking out, uh, for instance, the clover because it is impossible to get out. <laughs> so I focus on the plants that tend to be, um, that are, can be easily dug out, that are biennials. And so that you know, if you get them out, you're gonna have some, ch that they spread by seed, like mullein, like, um, like um, bull thistle. Uh, and I, and um, w in the other areas with some of the plants that have take, that can spread through uh, rhizomatically and, and take over landscapes, I've been studying those to see how other plants might help replace those. For instance, with the clover, yes, it's, it's widespread on the riparian edge, but uh, um, I've taken a series of photographs over a couple of years and I noticed that when the, clo when the willows come in, they immediately will shade out. And um, so, we'll, you know, hopefully we'll have some uh, natural uh, replacement. Lastly, um, these young people are actually taking out um, whorehound that's within the park. So I've worked with them to focus on uh, around the trails. And I know that sometimes it's like, oh, well, that's all you can see. But I think it's important to, for visitors to get a sense of what the native uh, plants are. And if we uh, protect and um, uh, accentuate those that native diversity. Uh, it it there's a value to that for for the visitor. So um, what I understand, I, I did different math. I got the 14 percent of the total so far is uh, non-natives, and uh, the most common family is the grass family grasses, and the most common genus of non-natives is Bromus, which should not be surprising. Um, in the Gila, cheat grass, particularly also in the in the cliff dwellings, is the most common and the most pernicious um, uh, non-native uh, uh, that I have seen. So I appreciate uh, so much. Um, the reason I take out non-natives is really because of the natives, and um, a, the cliff dweller valley I, is is so unique and is so rich and so diverse. And um, I'm urging everybody to to take the time to get up there and see as much as you can. And uh, I've talked fast, I think. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Patrice. So that concludes our presentation. And I'll just leave you with this question. Um, what good is a plant list? What kind of things can you infer about the integrity of a flora? What challenges are there to maintain that flora? Patrice really addressed that well. Just leave you with this: uh, those little over 500 basket plant species that, that we've documented in the last eight years. Think about this: that's more than one tenth of the entire flora of New Mexico, within within one square mile. It's botanically very interesting. So I'm done. I'm going to hand it over to our our chief, our uh, Mr. Don Graves, and thanks for attending and listening to us tell this tale about the. Spectacular flora of the Gila Cliff Dwellings National Monument. All right, stop. so Patrice, there was one, uh, one. Um, where'd it go? Uh, um, there was okay. one uh, chat here. What steps do you take oh. to keep the non-natives from seeding out? Um, that's a good question. I'm going to turn on some light here. I guess I've been in the darkness here. Um, it. Each of the plants, like if you're interested in getting, if you're interested in removing non-native plants, um, like anything, the best is to research 
the life history of the plant and then um, research what are when and what times are the best times to uh, remove it. So for instance, um, you know, so that that's really it. You find out what the flowering times are, and then you determine the best time to remove it. And with with mullen, it's 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 best to remove it before it flowers. Um, and uh, so generally, you you want to remove them before they flower. But some plants are spread rise mat, you know through their roots, so it's more difficult. One uh, on the Gila River. Uh, if anybody here who's on the um, on the chat from the Upper Gila Watershed Alliance. Uh, with them and um, people from up here in the cliff dwellings, we removed um, thousands of uh, tamarisk uh, or salt cedar from, from the main stem of the Gila River. And the timing of that is uh, very specific as well. So each plant has its own, uh, its own specificity. And I, it's sad to say there's a, a good way to kill uh, each plant, but uh, that's, that's the nature of it. <laughs> so Patrice, a, I know that we've had sad part of botany, but Patrice, we've had some members from the Gila Native Plant Society um, joining you on this uh, right. non-native plant eradication program. That's right. um, so I would suggest that you continue asking us for help, and um, we have friends in the Audubon Society and other groups around town that could probably um, give you a hand. I know it's hard work, but um, I think it's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, very much appreciated. Thank you. Any other questions, folks? For our esteemed panel? If not, um, well, we've talked about um, electric cattails. I thought that was one of the highlights. Um, thank you, Russ. The uh, volcanic and volcanism and monkey flowers and bull thistle and um, just a lot of uh, a lot of hard but I'm sure exciting and enriching field work and um, it, it's really nice to have a, a, a team like yourselves assembled and um, we will look forward to the when you publish your results. Uh, Wendy and I were at the Cliff Dwellings today hiking the uh, the middle fork of the Gila Trail and um, I saw some um, some old friends and uh, some some non-native <laughs> <Yes. laughs> folks as, as well. Okay so don't forget that on the 20th of November uh, Russ Kleinman will be back with uh, Ferns of the Gila and uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about what we have done um, in our programs, and it's been challenging with uh, the COVID challenge, but, you know, we've had programs on um, lichens and the cacti, and I know Keller Supercroft is going to give a program on the mycorrhizae and fungi and ferns, so we're really trying to branch out and, and include plants that uh, we often just sort of walk by and don't even notice. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. So I'm hoping you're enjoying it. So if there are no other questions, um, I'd like to thank you for um, attending tonight and we'll see you all on the 20th of November for the Ferns of the Gila. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.